so much for joining us for Alumni University. Um, I'm Kristen, the Director of Constituent Engagement here at Illinois Tech. Tonight we have Professor Patrick Corrigan who will be joining us. Um, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, all of the attendees' microphones and video have been disabled, but if you have a question for uh, Professor Corrigan, please type it in the chat box at the bottom of your screen and we will leave time at the end for him to answer your questions. Um, just a note that your viewing experience may be affected by your own internet connection. So if you're having trouble hearing or seeing any part of tonight's presentation, we recommend that you disconnect from Zoom and reconnect. Um, also just to note, this presentation is being recorded, including the chat box um, and will be available on our website uh, shortly after tonight's presentation. So to introduce our presenter, uh, Patrick Corrigan is a distinguished professor of psychology here at IIT. Currently, he is the principal investigator for the National Consortium for Stigma and Empowerment, um, which is a collaboration of investigators and advocates from more than a dozen institution, institutions nationwide. Uh, he has written more than 400 peer-reviewed articles he is editor emeritus of the American Journal of Psychiatric Rehabilitation and editor of a new journal published by the American Psycholo Psychological Association called Stigma and Health. Um, he is also the author of 15 books. His most recent book is The Stigma of Disease and Disability. And so with that, I will turn it over to Professor Corrigan to get started. Thank you. Thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, I assume everybody can see the slides. Yes, good, okay, good. Then thank you for joining us tonight at Alumni University and hearing my presentation of being a stigma of mental illness. Um, let me put it in perspective first. Um, Kristen did a nice job um, introducing me, just a few added tidbits. Uh, before coming to uh, Illinois Institute of Technology, I was a professor uh, of psychiatry at the University of Chicago and have been funded by National Institutes of Health um, for about 20 years in our research. And actually, our federal research and the benefits we get from it are offset by funds support we get from alumni. Um, in particular, we benefited from resources provided by Dr. Allen and Mrs. Gail Ludovitz, uh, uh, which really helps us go forward with our work. Uh, my area is broadly uh, psychiatric disability, rehabilitation, stigma, and health disparities. And as we talk a little bit more, I can define those better. But actually, when I prepared for this today, they thought you might want to put in perspective a better idea who I am, um, given my history. Uh, I'm actually an electrician, uh, for real, uh, which is probably good in an engineering school, electrical engineering. I worked for my dad's business, showed up when I was eight years old got my first set of tools when I was 12, started going out in the truck when I was 14, I actually started going out by myself um, soon after getting my driver's license when I was 16. Think about that, middle of the night, your lights are out, none of your appliances work, and the 16-year-old kid comes up to look at your fuse box to see if they can get things working. Um, actually, did electrical work through undergrad and graduate school. Things were a lot different back then in terms of tuitions and costs, but able to pay for all of school without having to get any debt. Uh, and actually worked and grew up in Evanston, Illinois. Um, anybody who's on from the North suburbs might recognize this is still my family business in Skokie, a Corrigan and Ferris Electric. And um, that's it for commercials for today. Let's get back to what we really want to talk about, which is the stigma of mental illness. Uh, my work would, maintain that the stigma of mental illness can be as much harm to the person as the symptoms and disabilities. That community's reaction to diagnoses like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and the like can be as hurtful and undermining a person's goals as hallucinations, delusions, and cognitive deficits. And so we know what stigma is. Stigma is a disrespectful image of people with mental illness, in this case is dangerous. And we know what the goals are. The goals are to stop it. About 25 years ago, I was still at the University of Chicago. We became very interested 
in the impact of stigma such that since I've been at IIT, my research is largely focused on not only what is the stigma of mental illness, but more importantly, how to fix it. And so what I wanna to talk to you about today is exactly what is stigma? Um, how might it be diminished? How do we fix it? Focusing on starting with what might be some unintended consequences. Um, the solution being in what we would say the power of disclosure is, what the benefits are of people with lived experience of mental illness coming out and telling their story. And one particular program we've had for that called Honest, Open, Proud, which is a program for people with mental illness to decide whether they want to disclose and how. So let's put it in perspective. The stigma of mental illness, while it is mental illness, and I was a psychiatry professor in a medical school, is not an issue of medicine. Stigma is an issue of social injustice. In the United States, we have some pretty compelling examples of social injustice and attempts to address it. Um, this is Martin Luther King Jr. coming across the Pettus Bridge in the Selma, Alabama, which was a 1960s laudatory example of dealing with racism. And this is what um, in the last 20 or 30 years we've witnessed um, in terms of LGBTQ rights. Even in the disability world, there are examples of um, stigma and efforts to try to break stigma. In the lower right hand corner is Justin Dart, who's frequently considered the champion of anti-stigma movement in the disability world. In fact, he was frequently called the Martin Luther King of disability rights. Here's the thing about it being injustice. Because it's an injustice, we positively, progressively minded people want to run in and fix it quickly. And in the process, we tend to make mistakes. We tend to do things which seem to be good ideas that actually have unintended consequences. For example, when Bill Clinton was president, the military had an active policy to identify gay, gay and lesbian soldiers and to run them out of the military. Um, the idea at the time to deal with this was don't ask, don't tell. If you don't tell us you're gay, we won't ask and you can stay in your position. The problem with that is it promoted the idea of closetedness. That as long as you're closet and you're secret, that's fine with us, which we realize in retrospect actually tends to make the whole experience uh, of being gay worse. Keeping things a secret is bad for one's mental health. Or another example, many of you are my age, might remember every um, Labor Day, Jerry Lewis had the telethon. It would frequently go 24 hours and more. You get a little tired at the end, but they would use images of people with, um, with the disease of interest that could at times approach being somewhat stigmatizing. For example, this young man um, said, if I grow up, I want to be a fireman, which is sort of gives the idea that, that was outlandish and out of his wheelhouse. Um, in retrospect, actually, when the, when the man grew up, he said he really disliked this kind of image because it sort of suggests um, having a successful light is outside his, his wheelhouse. Even more interesting, again, albeit Jerry Lewis would get tired. I mean, if I had to stay up for 24 hours straight, I'd be tired and saying things that might not be quite appropriate. He once referred to people with uh, muscular dystrophy as God's goose. This kind of puts in air issue a fundamental realization about how you deal with stigma. What we want to do is we want to stay away from any idea of pity that people with a stigmatized condition, in this case, a young man in leg braces or somebody with major depressive disorder or somebody with intellectual disability is pitiable. And instead we wanna replace that with parity, that that person has the same opportunities and rights as everyone else. Pity undermines that empowerment is what advances it. And so um, as I was introduced, um, I work a lot in the area of psychiatric rehabilitation. I actually wrote the textbook in psych rehab that's used in the graduate class at IIT. Psych rehab is an approach towards psychiatry where we try to help people with serious mental illness achieve the major goals that all adults seek. Getting through school, getting a job that's fulfilling, finding a significant other, having good health, finding a place to live. I wrote the textbook. I was editor of the Journal of Psychiatric Rehabilitation. But I come at this also as a person with mental illness. 
I've been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, major depression, generalized anxiety disorder. I've been hospitalized. I know the shame of having to stand in line for that one um, telephone that's on the wall to call my wife and tell her that I won't be at Elizabeth's school meeting that night. I took my meds this morning. And I know that stigma is a reality, not an abstraction. So while I come at this as a researcher, it partly reflects my own goals to try to change it. That said, about two years ago, I wrote a book called The Stigma Effect, it came out of Columbia University Press. It was looking at the unintended consequences of mental health campaigns. Some things that seem to be good ways to change stigma actually don't work very well. But before doing that, let's do a deeper dive in exactly what stigma is. Sam Keen wrote a book called Faces of the Enemy. Um, he's a sociologist and looked at through history how groups in power disrespected other groups by using the media. Um, in America, we have some pretty compelling and awful examples. Scientists say Negro is still on ape stage. I choose to use this horrible image for two reasons. One is it reminds me right away what the stigma of mental illness is it's the same category as racism and sexism and ageism and equally as hurtful. And two is that this comes from an 1890s science textbook. How science sometimes actually tends to perpetuate the stigma of mental illness. For this, this is from World War II occupied um, Denmark where the Nazis looked at people, in this case, Jews as rats disrespect a group by viewing them as animals. Or this, what one half of the population has done to the other half of the population. So the harder a wife works, the cuter she looks. What about the stigma of mental illness? How is it shown in the media? Perhaps one of the big ways that they've, is the media have used people with mental illness as dangerous. You see it in movies. This is Freddy Krueger from A Nightmare on Elm Street, the most popular cinematic maniac since Darth Vader. Or this, this is Jason from Friday the 13th. It's no wonder that our teens grow up with the idea that dangerousness, homicidal mania, and mental illness are all welded together. You see it in newspapers, like the New York Post, read Mental Patient Kills Mom, or the Daily News, Get the Violent Crazies Off of Our Streets. Now, these are tabloids. This is what tabloids are supposed to do. It's not right, but that's how they get your attention um, when you're standing in line at the supermarket. Maybe when you're IIT, you remember the reader. The reader is a weekly that came out um, pretty well done. This was a story they did some years back about the gentleman on the left who was a physician and then drug-induced psychosis killed his wife. Was found not guilty by reason of insanity, sent to Elgin State Hospital, which is a forensic unit for this part of the state. Um, some years later, everybody his lawyer, her lawyer, the doctors, the court thought he was ready to be returned to the community. The reporter, Ted Klein, wrote a pretty balanced article, but the editor slapped this headline, is this man a monster? And he ended up spending even more time in the psychiatric jail, as it were. You see in advertising, this offer could get you committed. Crazy Eddie's record asylum. To have these odd deals, you'd have to be committed. Maniac out of control. Or this, Lobster Lunacy. This is a billboard outside of Washington, D.C. Now, at one point, you might say, shouldn't we just lighten up a little bit? I mean, come on, it's just a little bit of humor to sell a product. Of course, in my, light, in my lifetime, you might have seen this. The chef does everything but cook. That's what wives are for. Just to realize that's no longer okay as a way of selling products. Sexism is not a good way to move merchandise. So similarly, this is a straitjacket filled with nuts, which won the Clio Award, which is the Academy Award of Advertising. You see it in comics, Gary Larson cartoon, a couple things wrong with it. One is the obvious message of just playing nuts about the fellow on the couch. But two, this is a psychiatrist doing it. And if it's okay for him to laugh at the person on the couch, it must be okay for anyone. Sir, these gentlemen from the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission are here to explain new rules of mental illness in the workplace. So George Herbert Walker Bush in 1990 signed the American with Disabilities Act, which meant to provide protections for people with all disabilities. It was in place five years, five years before anybody ever thought about applying psychiatric disabilities. The EEOC did 
and you saw cartoons like this, now you're going to get axe murderers and Napoleon and naked guys in your business as a result. S is for Stanley. Stanley's a crazy murderer, likes to murder little boys and girls on the early Sunday morning. Are you afraid of Stanley? This came off my daughter's bookshelf when she was a young girl. This is from um, Shel Silverstein, is frequently considered the William Shakespeare kids literature in his A to Z dictionary. Now, most of the stigma I've shown so far is the idea that people with mental illness are dangerous, but there are other versions too. One of them is benevolent stigma. That doesn't mean the stigma is benevolent and okay. It means that people with mental illness are looked at as big, stupid kids. And what they need is a benevolent figure, like a doctor like me to tell them what to do. So you see it in movies like the Dream Team. This is Christopher Lloyd, Peter Boyle, Michael Keaton who are psych patients who get away from their keeper in Manhattan and have this zilly, wacky day popping around New York because that's what people like them do. This actually captures both stigmas. On the right is the dangerous Jim Carrey, who's the maniacal police officer. On the left, he's the big dopey police officer, capturing in one. How to avoid hiring lemons, nuts, and flakes. What's particularly concerned about this, in addition to gathering all sorts of different stigmatized groups, is a human resource department and a major corporation came up with this flyer. You might ask, is it better? Now, I've been doing this presentation for a while. Even some of these examples are a little dated. But there is some ways of looking at it, whether it's changed or not. Most of the results is no. Um, pretend you don't see the woman in the front window. You're looking in the window of a printing company in downstate Ohio. You got a bottle of booze on a desk tipped over, chair on its side, two legs hanging down, a note saying contemplating suicide. Get your notes printed here. If that wasn't a big enough concern, she's the owner of the company and they try to explain what's wrong with that. She didn't understand what the big deal was. Or this, Trenton State Hospitals in downstate New Jersey. For those of you who remember Beautiful Mind with... Um, um, boy, I'm blocking out his name. The Nobel laureate from Princeton, the economics Nobel laureate. This is where he would go when he would relapse. Um, they had a fire on July 10th. Um, nobody was hurt, but the next day the headline said, roasted nuts. So I'd like to begin with examples from the media that hit us in the heart, but let's look at what the data actually shows. Some friends of mine, Joe Phelan and Bruce Link at Columbia did a study comparing the stigma of mental illness, comparing the stigma of mental illness in 1956 to that of 1996. And what they looked at is the degree to which the population believed people with mental illness are dangerous. Now, we've actually looked at epidemiologic data and shown that the rate of dangerousness in mental illness is grossly overestimated compared to reality. So this tends to be a proxy of the degree to which the population believes if you believe they're dangerous, you're sort of endorsing stigma. And what you might expect to find, and what you might expect to find is perhaps in 1956, there's about 40% of the population. And because there's so much more knowledgeable about st stigma and mental illness, it was cut in half. And what you actually find is it went in the opposite direction. It's gotten twice as bad. Stigma is getting worse, which is something I'll come back to. Matter of fact, they repeated this study in 2006, and what they found is that um, stigma is just as bad. There's still a huge number of people that believe people with mental illness are dangerous. Why? Well, perhaps one reason is the degree to which we equate these god-awful shootings we've had in Connecticut or Arizona or Colorado with with uh, mental illness. When these mass murders occur, people once say that person must have been crazy or nuts. And that has such power that actually a colleague of mine did a study in Australia that shown after the Sandy Hook shooting where the children were killed in Connecticut, the stigma about, about mental illness in Australia got worse. It's a very compelling sort of phenomenon. So what exactly is the stigma of mental illness? Well, I am an academic, and so like all academics, like all professors, you may remember, I can reduce every complex idea to one box. And so this is how I understand the stigma of mental illness based on structures down the side and types across the top. 
structures or stereotypes, prejudice and discrimination. Let me tell you about one group I know something about in terms of, of stigma. Stereotypes about Irish Americans are that they're all drunks and they neglect their families. Stereotypes are unavoidable in a culture. If you were born and grew up in mainstream American culture, you're going to know this stereotype. Prejudice is agreeing with it. Yep, that's right. They're all drunks and discrimination is a behavior. And so I don't want to hire them or rent them or be their friend. Of course, we're much more interested in what the stereotypes, prejudice and discrimination of mental illness is. Stereotypes is the people with mental illness the big one is the view that we're dangerous, but on top of that, the view that we're weak, we're incompetent, that we're incapable of making it through school or getting a good job. Prejudice is agreeing with that. Yep, they're bad. And therefore, I'm afraid of them and they should be ashamed of themselves. And discrimination is the behavior which we'll talk a little bit more about. But to make more sense of these structures down the side, let's look over the three different types of stigma. We talk about the difference between public stigma, self-stigma, and what we call label avoidance. Public stigma is what happens when the public agrees with the stereotypes and socially exclude people, don't help them obtain their, their goals. They have less likely to get employed where they want to, worse housing, they have worse educational opportunities, the legislature doesn't want to support their kind of interventions. You have the sad irony of people looking for inclusion in faith communities and some not being able to do it and over call for coerced treatment. And the second example is self stigma. Self stigma is what happens when people with mental illness internalize the stigma, agree that's right and use it against themselves. So for example, self stigma leads to lowered self esteem because I'm a mentally ill person, I'm not worthy or lowered self-efficacy, I'm not able to do anything, leading to what we call the why try effect. Why should I try to get a job? I'm not worthy of it. Why should I try to live on my own? I'm not able. Label avoidance is the last example, one that many people are concerned about. Let's put this in perspective, what I mean about that first by looking at what stigma is. Stigma is a Greek word for mark. And originally stigma, refer to obvious conditions. And so if you had a skin color different than me and you're a racist, I would discriminate against you because you're a black or Latino or Asian. If you had body features different than me, if you had sexual features and I was a sexist, I would discriminate against you. If you had gray hair and I was an ageist, I'd use that against you. The stigma in those conditions are obvious. However, the stigma of mental illness is not obvious. It's really hidden. If you're in a room of 100 people, you cannot tell who in that room has a mental illness, even though statistically about 20% of people will meet diagnostic criteria for serious mental illness. In some ways, the stigma of mental illness is like the stigma of LGBTQ. Now, let me be really clear about this. I'm not saying um, gay, lesbian, bisexual, or mentally ill. That was probably one of the more heinous things that psychiatry ever did. I'm saying that the stigma of LGBTQ is hidden just as the stigma of mental illness is hidden. And that's relevant when we come later to how you fix it. But how do you actually get the stigma if it's hidden? You get it by association, you get it by a label. And so if I see Clarence coming out of the psychiatrist's office, I could say, hey, that's Clarence coming out of the psyche and he must be nuts. And that's how you get the stigma of mental illness. And the result of that is that it leads to label avoidance or not seeking care. I'm not gonna go see a psychiatrist if everybody figures out I'm crazy and everybody discriminates against me. And research suggests almost half of everybody, whether you're diagnosed with benign illnesses, like, like a reaction disorder or a reaction of sadness if a loved one dies to more serious disorders like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, people won't seek out care in part to avoid the stigma. <coughs> One thing to keep in mind is erasing stigma is not enough. And to put this in perspective, consider what Lyndon Johnson said after passing the Civil Rights Act. He was speaking to Brown University, which is historically black college or university 
in Washington, D.C. at their commencement in the summer of 1965. He was talking about racism here. He said, you do not wipe away the scars of centuries by saying, now you are free to go where you want and do as you desire and choose to leave as you please. He said this calls for affirming actions and beliefs that you have to actually promote the idea that people of color have worth in their own, in their own uh, place. And so similarly, we know stigma has changed when the population agrees with the idea and promotes affirming attitudes. Affirming attitudes are the idea like people with mental illness recover. Now you might say, nah, that's not true. Not people with schizophrenia. But if you look at it from a disability viewpoint, people with schizophrenia, even though they have their schizophrenia with appropriate supports and treatment can achieve almost the same range of goals as everybody else. Consider the person in a wheelchair. We would never think somebody in a wheelchair couldn't go to law school or medical school and the like. And similarly, we would suggest that the people with mental illness determine their goals for themselves and how to get there. Actions are, re are um, community efforts to try to change the playing field. Reasonable accommodations are one. The American with Disabilities Act requires, for example, employment settings to change the setting so it meets the person's needs, assuming it doesn't cause undue hardship on the employment. Also, community supports can be a big boost um, that help people towards recovery and success. As I said, though, the goal here is not to talk about what stigma is, but how to fix it. And so let's talk about that briefly in terms of unintended consequences. Um, in particular, we've come up with different ways of looking at stigma, and we contrast here the effects of protest, education, and contact. Um, protest is the idea of saying, stop thinking that way. One way you see it is this easy idea. You want to just change the words. You just want to change stigma, change the words. Um, so, for example, Hansen's disease was leprosy. Um, dementia is now called Alzheimer's by act of Congress, mental retardation is intellectual disability, mania is bipolar illness. You actually find in our Asian colleagues a more structured way to do this. They're trying to change the name of schizophrenia. So Japan went from Seishin Banetsu Bio to Togo Shitko Sho, which translates from mind split disease to integration disorder, which is a less, uh, a less disrespectful way of talking about people with those conditions as has Korea done this, Hong Kong, Singapore, China, enough places there's actually been a review of its impact. I mean, it's interesting, there's this movement in the United States to change the name of schizophrenia. After all, schizophrenia has got the word schizo in it by itself. People want to change it to Bloiler's syndrome. Any of you took intro to psych when you're an IIT, you may remember Eugen Bloiler was a psychiatry from, psychiatrist from Switzerland who first um, identified the basic elements of schizophrenia. People have looked at what happens when you change the words. What would happen if we change schizophrenia to boiler syndrome? There's been 47 studies. What happens to the general population when you stop calling it schizophrenia and start calling boiler syndrome? Nothing. I don't care what you call it, boiler syndrome, craziness, psychosis. He's still nuts and I don't want to be around him. Where you see a big effect is on providers. And the reason you see a big effect on providers is, can be seen in the DSM-5. I'm not sure if people know the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. The American Psychiatric Association puts this out every five or six years and it's a definitive definition of what psychiatric disorders and diagnoses are in the United States. This one came out about five years ago. Um, it's notable, for example, because they actually removed Asperger's disorder from the lexicon of, of ideas about uh, mental illness. Um, what happens is when you change the words, mental health professionals learn really fast. Because I learn really fast because I want to continue, uh, continue billing for my services. I need to know the diagnosis the insurers are looking at. Policy change, crazy is now on the growing list of politically incorrect words. Seems offensive to people of a certain mental state. The sanity challenged. Here's the problem with just saying all you gotta do is change the words, it looks easy. I mean, at some point the National Institute of Mental Health didn't really think it was a big problem and weren't gonna fund it anymore. 
even more you get into this kind of thing of word police, people fighting amongst themselves on what are the appropriate words to call people with mental illness. Now, clearly we have some words that, that are totally uh, forbidden in, in the English language, the N word probably being the best example. MR, mental retardation, is also rising to that level. But they're really in mental illness are not single words that everybody agrees is the way you should stop referring to it. And here's the problem. Those of us who are stigma advocates don't want to get into a battle amongst ourselves on what the right words are, because the average person on the street's probably not going to care. And you only got one shot out of them for changing things. Another way to try to change stigma is through education. Education, there's some examples in recent American history where they've tried to educate social concerns away. One of them is DARE. Um, my kids went to DARE. Um, at one point, DARE was in three quarters of all US school districts in 43 countries. It's typically done by a police officer showing drug paraphernalia and the risks and harm of using drugs. It was one of the rare times when the government really supported quite a bit of research on its effect. Four studies showed no positive effect to DARE. Sending kids to DARE had no difference in attitudes or behavior related to drugs compared to those who didn't. One showed a significant difference. Kids who went to DARE were significantly more likely to use drugs and alcohol at follow-up. Another example that's really becoming um, current and of concern is the idea that vaccines cause autism. Um, prior to the pandemic, this was a big concern, but the rate of childhood illnesses were going up and up uh, around the United States. Um, because of this, they've actually done public health research where they try to target parents, particularly mothers who hold this belief to get them to change their attitudes about it. And what they'll do is they'll show them fact sheets. This is a CDC fact sheet about vaccines and childhood disorders. They'll show them compelling videos. This is a young girl who gets measles and the fact that this could be quite serious and not just as an early a benign disorder. And they wanted to look at what kind of effects it has on people. Um, in terms of parents who measured their attitudes about vaccinations pre and post, there was almost no change. Whether they were against vaccines or not because of autism or not didn't change. What you found though, even more concern is their intention to vaccinate got significantly worse. They were less likely after hearing this information to believe that um, vaccinations are a good thing. Now that we're immersed in the pandemic and the rate of disinformation that's out there, we might understand this kind of finding even better. One way people have talked about changing the stigma of mental illness is to show uh, mental illness as a brain disorder. In 1990, NIMH launched the decade of the brain. This is a PET scan of a brain. The occipital lobe is in the back. Um, that's where the vision is. So in this case, it's lit up red, which means this person is having um, um, visual hallucinations. People did research, including us about 20 years ago, believing that if you saw information like this, you were significantly less likely to blame the person for their mental illness. After all, it's a brain disorder, it's not their fault. And that is true, that's what you find. Blame goes down. However, you also find this idea that people do not recover. They do not get better. It's hardwired in, you're stuck like this way. And that's the degree to which people, um, in which employers won't hire people with mental illness or landlords rent to them or doctors provide appropriate level of care. Contact is the one way we think, the best way we think to change stigma. The best way to change stigma is for people with lived experience of mental illness to come out and tell their stories to the rest of the public. This is Bob Lundin. Bob and I worked at the University of Chicago together for about eight years. Um, Bob and I are somewhat spiritually linked. We were born and graduated from grade school, high school, and college, all of within um, a few months of each other. When he got through college, he started a career in schizoaffective disorder. Schizoaffective disorder is combined schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And so when he goes around and tries to change stigma, he tells a story that, hi, I'm Bob. I have a severe mental illness. It's frequently good to actually throw the label in because that's the fastest way to get the stigma. In his case, his childhood was not unusual, which challenges the stigma that people with mental illness are born broken. 
that unfortunately his mental illness is traumatic. That's something important to say, because you look at Bob, you say, for real? Like, are you really mentally ill? Unfortunately, in his case, he's been hospitalized more than a dozen times. He'll abuse um, recreational drugs. He'll get in trouble with the law. And despite that, he's achieved. Bob now works full time as a mental health therapist in DuPage County, which is west of Chicago. I mean, he's actually written some plays that ended up in the Chicago stage before the pandemic. And so we are interested in the degree to which research shows what the effects are of education in blue and contact in red. Um, for those of you who are methodological wonks, I can tell you more about this offline. This is a meta-analysis. This is a summary of 17 separate studies. You don't need to know in a meta-analysis to look at the effects. Overall effects, the effects of contact are about twice that of education. In terms specifically of attitudes, they're about four times that. In terms of behavior, about one and a half times that. Contact is the biggest impact you have on people. So how do you change stigma? Well, we came up with a TLC model, targeted local credible continuous contact as a way to do it. Note the whole thing rests on contact. It is the person with lived experience who has the big impact in trying to change stigma. Targeted, I would like to wave my magic wand and get rid of the stigma of mental illness tomorrow. We haven't been able to do that with racism and sexism. So more short-term approaches is focusing on targets whose, if their behavior changes, is gonna impact people with mental illness for the better. Landlords, if they change their attitudes, they're more likely to rent to people. Healthcare providers offer a better standard of care. Teachers, more inclusive education. Legislators, better bills supporting mental health programs and employers. It should be local. What do we mean by local? Well, we rolled this program out at a World Psychiatric Association meeting in Ottawa, Canada. And you may know what Canadians think of American ideas. Um, if you're gonna roll something out in Canada, it needs to reflect Canadian interests. But the United States probably is even more difficult because across our 3000 miles, we're quite a diverse group of people. As you remember, IIT and I today am in the middle in Chicago in the heartland, the true soul of, of the US. People on the East Coast are all pumped up in caffeine and people on the West Coast are all zoned out on marijuana. And so if you need to develop anti-stigma programs, it needs to reflect those different parts of the world. But it gets even more complex than that. Illinois, to remind you, Chicago's in the upper right-hand corner of the state. Most of the state is country, agrarian, and small town. And so once you get outside of Cook County, if you're gonna develop something for Peoria, for example, it needs to reflect the interest of Peorians. Good stigma change also needs to be credible and continuous. Credible is the message needs to come from an audience that's relevant to the group. I have not had the honor of being in the US military. I have done a lot of work with the Department of Defense and the Veterans Administration regarding stigma issues. Um, we know that post-traumatic stress disorder and depression is going through the roof and there's a sad irony about it. Even though there's treatments for it, a lot of soldiers, sailors, um, air people won't get help because they don't want to be stigmatized. And so if you're going to try to change stigma, then Army needs to talk to Army, Navy, Navy, and Marines need to talk to Marines. Our research shows generally officers have more credibility with enlisted personnel, but not the other way around. And it needs to be continuous. Meeting Bob Lundin once is good, but it's not enough. And it cannot be carbon copies of the same Bob Lundin story. The more people you hear from, the bigger the impact. And so that leads to what I would consider to be the grand plan of changing stigma. Coming out, come out everyone, come out everywhere. In my lifetime, we've made great strides in the LGBTQ movement because about 30 or 40 years ago, courageous men and women decided to come out and talk about their sexual orientation. And so there's a similar thing going on in the mental health world. There are groups like Mad Nation out of San Francisco who are encouraging people to come out mad and come out proud and share their stories of mental illness as just one facet of the more complex picture. As a result of this, a lot of people are starting to come out. Famous people have come out. 
This is Rod Steiger, who had major depression from um, won the Academy Award for the Heat of the Night. Patty Duke, who was on TV and won an Academy Award, um, who suffered from bipolar disorder. Mike Wallace from 60 Minutes, also major depression. I love showing this slide to my students as famous people coming out because they say, who are those guys? And so they reminded me that in the current generation, there are equally notable people that have come out. This is Demi Lovato, who tells not only her story of mental illness, but also substance use struggles. Um, Jim Carrey, who I showed you before, who's out alternately with depression or, or bipolar disorder. Um, Leonardo DiCaprio, who's out with generalized anxiety disorder. And so famous people coming out can have an impact, but can have a limited impact. And the Thurgood Marshall effect is probably one perfect example of that. Many of you remember Thurgood Marshall was appointed to the Supreme Court bench by Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s. He's the first African-American to wear the robes. At the time, a lot of progressive people said, wow, that'll really change attitudes about black people. I'll look at him and say, look how accomplished he is. But it doesn't work that way. We tend to compartmentalize. We tend to say, Thurgood Marshall, this famous guy is not like other black people. This is John Nash, the Nobel laureate I was trying to remember earlier. He's from a beautiful mind. You look at him and you say, but he's not like other people with mental illness. His effects are kind of diminished. And so because of that, a group of us wrote a book called Coming Out Proud, Erase the Stigma of Mental Illness. It's 40 stories and essays of solidarities, with these being many of the authors. The first chapter is mine in the upper left-hand corner. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner is John Larson, who's a psychology professor. These are people telling stories about recovery and asking for, no, demanding solidarity. The goal is not to pass as straight, as sane. The goal is to accept the person where they're at and stand with them there. And so this has led to what we call the Honest, Open, Proud program. HOP is meant to erase the stigma of mental illness. I developed it with a group of about 10 other people with lived experience about a dozen years ago. Um, Honest Open Proud has three lessons to it. The first lesson is to consider the pros and cons of disclosing. What's going to be the good things and the bad things if I share my story of mental illness, which, by the way, will vary depending on whether I talk about sharing that story at work or in school or at my faith-based community. Second, there's different ways to disclose. So I work next to Betty at the office. She seems to be a nice person. I could take her to Starbucks and buy her some coffee and say, hey, have you seen the movie called Silver Linings Playbook? What did you think? And she says, I'm sick and tired of that Hollywood show and mentally ill people is just like us. That's probably not a good person to come out to. And third, it's your story. You craft it so it works for you. These are all changing dynamic things. It's taken me quite a while to come public and talk about my story. What that story is and what I share varies depending on who the audience is. Typically, Honest Open Proud is done by two trained facilitators, two people with lived experience, um, usually with three to eight peers. Three people are in the closet deciding whether to come out, usually done in three to four sessions. You might think my goal is to get everybody to come out of the closet, and we're quite clear about that is not the purpose of Honest Open Crowd. I'm not trying to talk people into disclosing. As a matter of fact, if I stand anywhere with this, I, I reiterate a statement once made by a Supreme Court judge, it's hard to stop the clanging bell. Once you're out, it's hard to go back. But that said, I'm convinced there are some benefits to it so that even if you decide not to disclose in the near future ever, you still benefit from the idea of knowing you have that power to make that decision. One of the things you might say about Honest Open Proud is what's this pride term? What's there to be proud of? Well, somehow, despite the fact that my mental illness derailed my education by about 10 years, I was able to get through and get a diploma um, and it's not the diploma itself or having a doctorate that I'm proud of, it's that despite the disability, I was able to get through that. As a matter of fact, one of the things with mental illness, one of the things with me is every so often it's black dog rears its ugly head and comes back. And it's an accomplishment to stay the course and keep going. But pride is also an issue 
of authenticity of who I am. This is the Irish America, this is the Irish flag. Um, every March 17th, uh, one of the best things my parents ever did is name me Patrick because I can go out and celebrate and I tell everybody about my Irish heritage. It's nothing I ever earned. It's nothing I accomplished It's part of who I am, as is the experience of mental illness. Mental illness is part of who I am. And if I want to share that, I should be. It's not always entirely a dark thing to be ashamed of. It really changes the dialogue I learned about mental illness when I was an intern. When I was an intern, we taught people to get away from your disease identity. You don't want anybody to know you're a psych patient because they'll treat you differently. What we learn now in the modern times, what I learned from my students is that part of mental illness is part of who my human identity is. And I should be in a place to embrace that identity and share it as I choose. We actually believe there's two positive effects to coming out to disclosure. One is the self-stigma. Remember, self-stigma is the loss of, of shame, the sense of shame I have when I internalize stereotypes. Um, in this case, when I feel like I don't have to be a closet, the shame goes down and the stigma goes down. It also has a benefit on public stigma. Public stigma, again, remember the best way to change public stigma is when the naive public has contact with people with lived experience. The more people who come out of the closet, the more there will be in changing that dialogue. We've done a lot of research on this. I'd be glad to dialogue with you separately. Um, it, what the heck, it's 616 Chicago time. Um, to go through the data and the graphs right now would only lead to your early um, turning in. So instead, let me put in perspective more where things are with HOP today. Uh, so I'm proud, originally started in the USA. Um, it moved to Canada. It's since then been uh, adapted for each of these countries here. Realize adaptation is a lot more than just changing the language. For example, um, when the Dutch tried to translate Honest Open Proud for the Netherlands, um, some of the examples on Honest Open Proud is coming up to your, is how to come out, how to disclose to your faith-based community. They said, we don't have faith-based communities in the Netherlands. So, so they stripped all of that out. We're doing a project in China right now. The active role of family in the lives of people with mental illness is significantly greater in China, such that HOP is, is assuming more of a family-centered approach. Frequently, when I go around talking to people, I talk to them based on my work in psychiatric rehabilitation as healthcare professionals. I'm not doing that today. I'm talking to you not only as IIT alums, but also with advocates in trying to move the agenda to changing the stigma of mental illness. Um, the United States has some proud example of advocates who've done major things in changing injustice. This obviously being Dr. King and what he's done. Um, actually the mental health side has the same thing. This is Clifford Beers, who in the beginning of the 1900s was hospitalized in the Connecticut State Hospital for mental illness. Think about what people thought about him more than 100 years ago. And he said in 1909, to make a difference, I must fight in the open. Mr. Beers launched what was called the Mental Hygiene Movement, which has since become Mental Health America, which has actually led to Mental Health Awareness Week. And so when I do these presentations, I like to end with a prayer from a famous advocate. Let our first act every morning be to make the following resolve for the day. I shall not fear anyone on earth. I shall fear only God. I shall not bear ill will towards anyone. I shall not submit to injustice from anyone. I shall conquer untruth by truth and resisting untruth. I shall deal with all human suffering. Great statement. Good for us. I'm open to questions or comments. First though, this is my contact information, corrigate at iit.edu. If you have, want to engage in any of this discussion, I do this as an advocation and I'll get back to you quickly. Thank you all for listening. I'm gonna turn the screen off and turn it over for questions and comments. Thank you so much. Um, we have a lot of questions that have come in. Um, so uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions. If anyone uh, else has questions, please, Keep typing them in the chat and we will try to get to as many as possible. 
Um, so the first question we have is, what are some ways to support colleagues or classmates who share their mental illness story? How can we help colleagues or classmates share their mental illness story? Or I guess it's uh, who have shared their mental illness. Who have shared? Yes. Okay, great. Excellent questions. So let me go back to who does stigma change rest with? Stigma change rests with the person with mental health challenges. I mean, to change um, homophobia, LGBTQ community leads the charge. I'm a straight male. Um, I'm all for gay rights, but my position in that is as an ally. Similarly, if you don't identify as a person with mental illness, you are an ally. And in that regard, let's not diminish that at all. You have an important role, but the agenda, how to help that person tell his or her story, how to help make a difference in the setting they're in is I would ask them, what do they want? Do it help you reinforce this? It's ironic because sometimes you might say, well, aren't you a brave little psych patient for coming out? which could unintentionally make things even worse. So engage them in a conversation, say thank you for your bravery, your courage, and what can we do to promote this further? Great. Um, oh, and we have a, a I think related question um, from Fred. He said, how do you advise an employer who is willing to hire an employee with mental illness, but wants some confidence that they will have a reliable employee? How, what's the last part? Want to know that um, a reliable employee? Yes. So how do you advise an employer who is willing to hire an employee with mental illness, but wants some confidence that yeah. they will have an, a re reliable employee? So what we do in our anti-stigma program with employers is we'll go to employers with a person with lived experience and his boss. Um, and the person with lived experience say just what we said, I've had experiences, but um, I've uh, gotten through it. I'm, despite my diagnosis of schizophrenia, I'm a successful worker in a law firm. Here's my boss, Mr. So-and-so, what do you say? Mr. So-and-so says, yes. Here's the other thing though, they'll give confidence is what's in the American with Disabilities Act is reasonable accommodations. If, with the, if the person's disabilities are still active, with the support of a rehab counselor, you can frequently make accommodations to this work setting so the person can be successful. Let's be clear with employ, with, about employers. No employer wants to fire anybody. First off, they're mostly, they're good people. And secondly, it's not good business to fire people. It's it just the amount of retraining and getting in a position and the like. And so working with a rehab person to provide accommodations for the person to stay on the job frequently is a win. Great, uh, thank you. Um, so our next question was, do you think mental illness is more, is more prevalent uh, today versus the 1950s or do you think it is just more properly diagnosed today? Um, you know, it's really hard to break out mental illness from diagnosis. Um, and so there's probably a higher rate in epidemiologic studies because of diagnosis, because diagnostic instruments are better. It is interesting, too, in how the times look at it. When I was a student some 40 years ago, um, trauma actually was out. Um, people didn't like to talk about trauma because they equated it with Sigmund Freud and all the mistakes Sigmund Freud made. About 15 years ago, people woke up and realized trauma is a big deal. Lots of people in the world experience trauma, not just in war zones, but from crime and what you observe and the like. And trauma diagnoses have gone way up. I'm not sure that's a result of trauma itself as much as we're becoming much more sensitive to these kind of things that exist. Eating disorder is another example. 20, 30, 40 years ago, we didn't even recognize eating disorders. And people realized this is a pathology. It can have all sorts of negative consequences. So we start becoming sensitive to it. That's interesting. Um, so we have a question from uh, Glenn. Um, how long did you take to realize and agree that you have bipolar internally? Uh, Glenn has a friend that even though she's been diagnosed as bipolar, she doesn't believe it because 90% of the time she feels like there are no signs or behavior changes? Wow, well, you're asking two tough questions. 
um, what's my story and then what's other people's stories? And I'm hesitant to guess on the other people's stories. Um, I can tell you what, what might sound like a major aha moment. Um, keep in mind, I have a bachelor's, master's and doctorate in clinical psychology. I did a postdoc at UCLA. All through college, I was in and out of the uh, uh, psych programs and meds and doctors and the like. And I came back from UCLA in crisis yet again and went to see a psych resident who was probably three years younger than I was at the time, who said, oh, Mr. Corrigan, your depression's back. And that's like the first time it was like, wow, you know, you're right. That's probably, it is probably a mental illness. It's probably not other things. So it's personally a journey. And um, the point about bipolar disorder is interesting. Um, in the clinical lore, there's an issue about people with bipolar disorder frequently not recognizing it. There's some evidence that when they're acutely ill, when they're manic, um, they really don't recognize it. But the other irony about bipolar disorder is a lot of part, a large part of our bipolar disorder is fun. And so who wants to take meds to get rid of the fun? So I don't know what's going on in your person's case. Let me just say one more thing about this. Um, is I think diagnosis can be overrated. I don't think that person's got to admit I have a diagnosis of bipolar disorder to get better. I think that person needs to understand what is her life goals and what going on in her life that gets in the way. Um, maybe not sleeping gets in the way. Maybe going using your credit card and wiping out your checkbook gets in the way. And what can you do to deal with it? Right. That's uh, very helpful. I, I hope that answers your question, Glenn. Um, we have a question from Meg. Um, she is currently working with transition aged youth. And one of the things we are seeing is a great deal of self stigma and or students not wanting to associate with a label. Do you have tips on how to encourage students to embrace their diagnosis? Obviously it is difficult to educate on disclosure or before students have that self-awareness. Um, for those of you who don't have the training Meg has, transition age youth is a strange group of people we refer to who are somewhere between high school and after um, because the educational system in the United States is more or less set up. So in principle, during grade school and high school, there should be rehabilitation plans and education plans to help you. And once you get out of high school, you frequently go in this never, never land um, where um, set up programs are more confusing. And so the question is, well, I'm probably going to be redundant. The question I heard Meg say is, what does, what do we do with these people to get them to accept their diagnosis? Um, I don't know if accepting your diagnosis is worth it. Um, what if, for example, you were a person who's overweight? And we said, we want you to do is accept the fact you're fat. Um, people, that's just not going to go very well as an intervention. What you want to do is you want the person to ask themselves, how does this issue like being overweight interfere with the goals in their life? And what can they do to deal with the goals in their life? This idea of you have to have insight and admit your mental illness is actually overrated and probably not true. It probably ends up getting in this big battle. Admit you're schizophrenic. I'm not schizophrenic. Admit you're schizophrenic. I mean, why don't we just start off in the same place together and work together? Great. Thank you so much. Um, we have uh, two more questions. And then I think if, if anyone else has further questions, if you would like to email them to Professor Corrigan, because I know we're running short on time. Um, but we have a question from Jesse. Um, what do you think about the difference between people who are taking medication um, and those who wish to cope with mental illness through other types of therapy, such as alternative treatment through talk therapy, support groups, diet, and exercise? Are a combination of such therapies like medication and alternatives compatible? So part of the job in these things is to shock people. Let's put it in perspective. I'm a licensed psychologist. I spent the first 15 years of my career in a medical school. I actually did original research on the effects of meds and cognitive functioning. I believe meds have some benefits for some people. Um, if you choose not to take your meds, you're not any different than almost everybody else with every other med you take. People who take blood pressure medications have side effects that decide they don't want to take it. People who take heart medications decide they don't want to take it because of its effects. 
Um, psychiatric medications have side effects to them. Psychiatric medication, the benefits might not be felt. My first goal is to help people understand what the barriers are to a full life and how to achieve it. Meds are one way. Um, I'm a psychologist. I'm taught, I'm trained in cognitive and behavior therapies, which I think are good. But Jesse also talked about what in the old days we go alternative therapies. My God, you mean pyramids? Absolutely. There is research that suggests Qigong, which is a, a Chinese um, approach to medication. Um, St. John's wort, um, 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 tai, tai Chi, I'm blocking an acupuncture, all can have benefits for people. It's at the end of the day, the person should get educated on what different possibilities, try on what they want that fits their needs and go forward as long as it helps them. Perfect. Um, and our, our last question is from Jim. Um, how could we take advantage of uh, Naomi Osaka, she's the tennis star, um, her recent disclosure about her struggles off of the court. And I, I think she had uh, spoken about anxiety and, and mental illness and not wanting to speak with the media. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part about it. Um, how can we take advantage of Naomi Osaka? How might we take advantage? Yes. Got it. Okay. Um, and similar to that, uh, Prince Harry and uh, Oprah and Glenn Close have started a TV series where they talk about their own experiences with mental illness. Um, I think talking about mental illness is another part of your life is um, another step forward that normalizes it and undermines the discrimination to it. Just keep in mind, while we can learn a lot from this, this person who was quite brave to change her career mid-stroke because of her own experiences, or Prince Harry, or Oprah, what has a bigger impact is the person who sits next to you in the office or in the pew in your faith-based community or your extended family. So the degree to which the average person comes out is the degree to which things will get better. Well, thank you so much. Um, my email up. I said we went through this fast. Don't hesitate to email me with questions. We can, I can get back to you with stuff. Um, and thank you so much. Um, I think uh, Tracy had asked if you could share the website um, that you mentioned as well. Um, I can also share that um, uh, Professor Corgan's contact information is on our website at iit.edu under the directory. Um, so links to his website and his email are there as well. So thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Um, as a reminder to everyone, um, we have one final alumni university uh, this summer. It will be on uh, July 6th with Professor Carly Kirsarek. Um, She will be speaking about American Girl Dolls and some issues in gender in the media. Um, so we hope that you can join us and, and thank you again Professor Corgan, this has been wonderful. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you all for spending some time with me. Thank you.